about two years ago, I think, there were a couple of students in the class said, you know, Simone, you should bring some more samples to the class. You know, because you talk and talk and talk and talk. So it's only the past two years that I actually started accumulating stuff. And it's going very well. <laughs> so um, I thought of bringing these just as a, you know, to tie up a little bit with what we were talking about yesterday. Um, yesterday we had a corrosion as a cause of failure. What else do we have? Um, well, we didn't really talk about the, uh, the wheel exactly what happened. The, the surface coating just got damaged and that's why it cracked all around. This one is a case of overload and the reason you can see that is there's a crescent shape on each of them in one area. So that's, that was a pre-crack. No, they don't match together. These are two different fractures. And that actually is something you all need to know. We don't want to do this, putting them back together, because then when you go to the microscope, all the features where the crack started get smushed. Um, so if you, ever have, if you ever witness something that breaks, it's the most common thing to do, try to see, yeah, is this really going with this one? Um, but it's, it can be a problem. Um, so the reason I know it's an overload is it's a bolt. And what you'll see on the fracture is there's a region that's really flat. It looks about this big. So this is the pre-crack. It's fairly smooth. And it really started on one point. And then there's the other bolt that's just about the same. I think it's a little bigger if I remember from looking at it this morning. So as opposed to the wheel uh, for the train, um, it's not starting to crack all around. It really started at one spot and went from a certain location down. So what happened here was the installation of the bolt. So say you have a joint, so you got two pieces here that you're connecting together. I'll put a little gap between them, even though you're trying not to avoid that. So this is what you're trying to connect together, the two pieces of material. Then you got your, um, say you have your nut here, and it's slanted a little bit. Here's the tread. It puts a bending load. It's a very common way by which fasteners fail. Um, and if you know you have an application where your bolts is gonna be very highly loaded, they have these special spherical bear, um, um, nut bearing bushing um, washers thank you uh, that will essentially redistribute the load more evenly and it's very useful for this situation um, if you're gonna have vibration if you're gonna have high load if you can have a corrosive environment or the situations where you can start cracking at the root of the tread here and clearly see after the fact that if the bolt was loaded square uh, there will not have been any failure. Um, it was a big uh, levy, um, so they were essentially bearing, building a seawall. And the biggest problem in terms of trying to mitigate this is they could not access the landfill side uh, to repair it. So we, we had a lot of ideas. The most practical one was to oversize the hole here and, and connect back a little further. But the, unfortunately, you talk to you know pretty basic engineers sometimes that essentially say it's not in the book, so I don't want to do it. So it, something that can look very simple sometimes gets very complicated. Um, but um, it got resolved after a while. So it's, it was interesting because Another metallurgical lab looked at those fractures before, before I got my hand on it, and they never really said, well, there was a pre-crack about this big. <laughs> so, the, you know, you think it's very simple, but it's, it just takes a little bit of experience and also um, just examination. So we, whenever there's something that breaks, just looking at it very carefully, you know, is there something special to the tread? We talked a lot about these hot forming processes. So you can make treads by rolling, 
and end up with a, with a rolling defect into your tread. And you can see it very easily if you just go even to a zoom microscope, a stereo microscope at 50x. So it's, it's a lot of times you can get a lot of information pretty quickly. Um, but then you still need to figure out how to avoid the problem. That's actually a lot of times is the hardest part. Probably the hardest part is to avoid the problem in the first place. We talked about that yesterday. Okay, so today is heat treatment and I will be talking both two very different ways to make the material stronger. Uh, so it's very, very different for aluminum and that, that it is for, uh, for steel. So we're going to do both of them today. And I'll try to go uh, at a reasonable pace so you remember uh, some of it. Um, before we get too far, I tend to forget these things. I've posted on Stellar um, some references. Let's see here, just so you know what we have there already. OK. So when we were talking about the, uh, the fracture surfaces yesterday, Hertzberg is, to my knowledge, the best uh, practical scientist in terms of interpretation of fracture surfaces. So I actually posted, I think it's the entire book, if I'm not sure, but there's one chapter in particular that talks about more in details about the crack propagation lines. Uh, Dieter here, if I remember, mentioning him in the context of forming, you know, all these hot rolling processes and you have stamping, you have a lot of forging details that we have not talked about. So if you're interested in that, uh, you can see the Aider. And earlier on in the class, we had the casting, um, the casting conversation here with Porter and E. Sterling. And these people also have a chapter on um, heat treatment of uh, aluminum that's very detailed, uh, but kind of intuitive. There's a lot of images, and it's easy to follow through. So if you're interested, uh, it's a good reference for both topics. OK, so back to the aluminum. Why are we using aluminum? Give me some example here. Yes. What else? In general, yes, that's true. So you can have, um, you know, a fishing boat that doesn't need that doesn't really need paint and go on the water. If you go to seawater, sometimes you still need to protect it um, because it's it, it just gets attacked with the salt. So the the the, the aluminum. So the, the I'm glad you mentioned corrosion. Um, the aluminum alloys, and I want to talk to you about corrosion after we talk about welding. So what's left for us for this term is mostly welding and then corrosion, just because it ties into the surface coating. And we'll talk about stainless steel, a lot of things that I think engineers should know. Um, aluminum. It's so simple yet not known that the aluminum oxide on the surface is going to be stable only approximately here in a range of pH 3 to 9. And, and there are references on this and people don't necessarily agree. So if you are in concrete, for example, um, you can have pretty accelerated corrosion. Um, you, concrete, we're looking at a pH of 11 or 12, so the, the idea of embedding aluminum in concrete in a moist environment is not good. Uh, if you're in a fairly acidic environment or you can be exposed to acid, again, you lose your protective coating and the aluminum will corrode very quickly. Uh, so <laughs> it's generally corrosion resistant. Um, the other aspect that happens uh, with aluminum uh, sometimes is pitting. Um, and that doesn't really lead to a significant thickness loss. But um, in terms of surface finish and all that, that's where the salts come in. Because as, when you have a salt deposit on the surface of aluminum locally, you're starting to vary your pH. And then that's how you start getting a, a pitting action. So, and, th and that's what happens with bolts. So, so if you have a fishing boat that's anchored in the, in the sea 
when it's stationary, that's where you have the highest likelihood of getting your corrosion taking place. Um, with respect to strength, um, it's another very interesting topic. So you guys like megapascal or, or KSI? Megapascal, right? OK. Uh, we'll try to do megapascal. Um, we have to convert it. So five times at around 40 megapascal is where you start um, your sigma yield with aluminum alloys. Um, and with steel, you're starting at 200. The, the softest steel you get is going to be about 200. So what is the benefit here? Okay, it's, it's lightweight, but if you use pure aluminum, it's extremely soft. So the, the only reason why we can make use of aluminum and, and consider it you know, a, a weight advantage is because of the, the, the heat treatment done to it. If it wasn't for, the, any, for heat treatment, aluminum will not be able to compete with steel on a weight basis. Uh, so how do we heat treat it? Um, it's essentially by precipitation and the best way to explain it fortunately or unfortunately is with a phase diagram. I'll try to do it two ways. So try to appeal to your physical intuition and also if you do know thermodynamic and phase diagram then you, you have an advantage here. So what we're looking at there in this vertical axis is temperature and then composition. So if we take aluminum and we want to add copper to it, which is a very common alloying element. Um, if you at a certain temperature, so over here, say with about four or five hundred degree centigrade, we can have up to about four percent copper into the aluminum, and it's still going to be in solution. So aluminum is only the black atoms here. So it's a face-centered cubic. For, so forget about it, all the brown ones. Um, so it's, it has a lot of sites um, for having other atoms into solution. It's, and at high temperature, there's more spacing between the atoms, so you're more tolerant to having another type of atom in your structure. Now, so what happens as the temperature cools down, the spacing is reducing, and then by equilibrium, you want the copper out of your crystal. So uh, the way to do this, uh, we call it precipitation. So it's the formation of a second phase. Just So I'm glad we spent a, a fair amount of time at the beginning talking about solidification, because it's the same thing here, except that we're going from a, a massive set of crystals, of grains, of uh, a solid, and now you're trying to build another solid into it. That's the only difference as opposed to doing solidification. Um, you will want to start at grain boundaries um, because the, of the energy, but if you pick your temperature correctly, you get to have much more of these uh, precipitation to take place. So um, it's important to think of a certain minimum nucleus size that is going to allow you to form the very first second phase, so a, a copper rich phase into the aluminum. Um, but you don't want to be um, too high in the temperature. So, this is where things get a little more complicated. If you were, I'll draw it because it's going to be helping us. So if we have temperature here and we have this essentially single phase, so this is a FCC aluminum and we're putting copper into it. At this peak of uh, composition, so let's say this is about 500 degrees centigrade, we have our peak here, we're putting about 4% copper. So if I just lower to this point and wait a very long time, 
I can start diffusing the copper and make these big inclusions at that point at grain boundaries, at the, at the surfaces of the alloy. Now, because we're talking about a solid here, it will take a very, very long time. So the idea that, um, you know, essentially having dendrites would be a problem and, and things that you can see visually is not happening just because of the very sl slow diffusion rate in the solid. So what you can see in this graph is that you're looking at temperature a lot more halfway here where you start getting nucleation to take place pretty quickly. So what exactly it takes to make the nucleation? Um, you can see here in this diagram, this is 500 nanometers. So you're starting having particle here that are about 100 nanometers maybe 20 nanometers that start forming at the time. So essentially, all the copper atoms, instead of being randomly distributed at one point in time, get into this little 20 nanometer zone. And that is big enough that the additional surface energy created at that area is less than the gain in uh, thermodynamic energy from the phase transformation. So you start forming them. Um, they look very, very small at the beginning. And then if you wait longer, they, they will essentially, you have a, a, a merging of very, very small precipitate to make bigger ones. So it's, it's a very, very gradual evolution of the microstructure from essentially a single phase. So uh, what does that lead to? So we're talking about essentially having little particles and you have a very, very high density of them in each grain. So they interact directly with the dislocations is what they do. Um, but only if they're above a certain size and below another size. So very, very fine precipitate like this you can have the dislocation go through them. Not much of a gain here. Very, very large one, they become separated from the actual grain and they become more of an inclusion and the dislocation can just go through the, to the grain boundary or the interface between them. No strengthening. So it's only in between that you will have the strengthening effect um, we talked about that before. So in the aging process, that's, that's what we call it. So the process here, just so we're all clear, you heat it up, it becomes a single phase. Then you quench um, because you don't want to go through this temperature here where you start forming very, very big precipitates. So you, you lower very quickly nothing happens so that when you quench the aluminum it essentially becomes super saturated in copper at ambient temperature and then you heat it back up at the temperature that you want to make this precipitation treatment uh, now <laughs> there are exceptions of course so rivets for aircrafts are a little different because the aging is going to progress at ambient temperature. So the way they do this is they, they quench it to, I think it's minus 50 degrees centigrade. They, they, anyway, they quench it very, very cold. They keep it in the freezer until it's time to install it on the aircraft. And after it's installed is when the aging takes place in the shop to make it strong. Um, and that just has to do with the, the exact composition that you're looking at. So the range here where you want to do your aging treatment varies depending on whether you're adding copper, whether, whether you're adding uh, magnesium, for example. Those are two very common alloying elements. Yes? So why do they age on the aircraft? Um, well, because otherwise it would be very hard to put the, 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 uh, the rivet. 
So you want, you want a very low strain, high ductility. Thank you for asking. It's just, this is where, <laughs> so, so you start with essentially a rod and you make them, you mushroom it. So you get, you know, maybe 30, 40% strain. You're not the only one who didn't who miss that part. So um, it's, it's very, it's, it's a very, very large volume industry <laughs> uh, in terms of number. Uh, but um, it's a simple process and then they will have this quality control to make sure the rivets don't stay in the, in the equipment too long, uh, don't warm up before you put them on. Um, now, perhaps you can see that there is a little bit of a downside to this. Um, we're looking here at our size evolution. So we're starting here and we either heat up or just wait, right, for the rivets. We're saying we're just waiting to form these precipitate. Now, you can see most of these curves, except some of, well, yeah, most of these curves have a peak that they go through and then it's lowering again. So, it, and that's where sometimes it's important to think of this, is if, if your aluminum is going to get hot, you can pass through the peak and start reducing the strength again. So I've seen that being a problem with the wings. So the aircraft wings have the, this de-icing system, so they, they bypass the air from the engine to feed into this channel into the wing. And then uh, if you have the grade of aluminum that age, uh, say, at 200 degree, um, no, it was going to 150 degrees centigrade inside. Then um, you're going to soften it. You're reducing you, the yield of the aluminum alloy. So, you know, there are limits. Is all, is all I'm saying, and they are based on exactly how you get that straightening. Um, maybe just a little um, nomenclature here. Um, if you do go and buy. Aluminum alloy, you, can, you have a lot of 6061. This is a nomenclature from the Aluminum Association. This specifies essentially the chemistry. It's a four digit number. You have, um, you know, 2024 is kind of a rivet type aluminum. This is more structural shapes. And then you have the 7000 series. So these three series, 2000, 6000, 7000 are the most common um, series that have a heat treatment on them. And then if you want to have it with the heat treatment, you have to specify it. So they use T, which is not really appropriate here because it's not tempered. So you'll hear the word tempered when we're talking about steel, but here um, it's really for aging. So a T6 is very common for a 6061 series. What it means, T6, is you age up till the peak hardness here. Um, for the rivets, we call it T3. Um, that's a natural aging at ambient temperature. Now, in the case of the rivets, um, I do want you to think in mind that uh, it's not just the temperature. When you form the rivet, you, you, you essentially have a lot of strain hardening and you're multiplying your dislocation density. The dislocation, all that movement helps create the precipitates. So that's, so that's essentially, then they put a 5-1 for that, just to say that it's strain-induced precipitation. Uh, you will also have it on the fuselage pieces when you stretch form them. So you get the piece, it's already been Solution treated and quench, you form it by that stretch forming that we looked at yesterday on the die. And because of all that deformation and the movement inside the aluminum, it helps initiate the uh, precipitation treatment. So at the end, you're left with a 7,000. You can have anything you want here. So you can have um, a T6, sometimes, a lot of times we use T7 on the 7000 series and it's for corrosion resistance. So if you, if you pass this peak and you have bigger precipitate, you, you're improving your pitting resistance of the aluminum alloy. So a lot of fuselage material is going to be the T7 as opposed to a T6. Um, 
So just to give you an idea, at the beginning we started with a 40 megapascal. Um, when you go through all these heat treatment here, you can expect something of the order of 50 times 7, 300, 400 megapascal is the range of yield strength after the heat treatment. So it's a factor of 10. Pretty interesting. Pretty good. Um, and that is something that you lose if you reheating the alloy above its annealing point. So in this case, if you go back here, definitely uh, here you essentially grow your precipitate, so you lose some of the strain. And here you're going back to solution. You're becoming the softest again. So it's, again, a compromise. Um, it's, it's very useful for uh, lightweight, as you pointed out. Um, it's also good for corrosion. It's more expensive. So if for a large structure, that's a reason why we, don't, we prefer using steel. It's really a question of cost more than um, you know, usefulness. Um, some people say it's hard to weld. If you, if you know how to do it and you have the proper equipment, it's really not a problem. Um, so I want to show you a, an, a, an example I worked on. Um, it's a radio telescope. I wasn't a citizen back then, so I was not allowed to see exactly where the telescope was looking at. But essentially, these structures are about um, 300 feet in diameter. And they are they organized to orient in all directions. So the, the entire ditch can rotate this way and this way as well uh, to collect signal from the extra space. Uh, the main criteria if you're designing this is the shape of the ditch needs to remain within certain limit as you move from vertical to flat and all, all directions around it. So it's, it's a design that is highly limited by stiffness. Weight does matter because of the size. Uh, you know, you need to put this on bearings and you need shafts and gears. And uh, if you wanted to make it out of steel, um, it will be more expensive in this case, even though it's not a flying object or anything like that. Um, so they do make it out of aluminum. It's the most common material. It's a tubular structure. And that leads me to Discussing a subject, um, so this is how you make a bike, right? You just take the tubes and weld them together. Um, it's good, but um, it's not the best way to make joints that will resist cyclic loading. Um, so that's why on bicycle, all the welds are really oversized really, really oversized. The, 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 all these zones, and these are not areas that you want the highest stresses to be. Sometimes it is. Anyway, it's not an optimal structure. The best way, if you're going to be using tubular structures, is to use gusset plates. So we see it here on kind of a tower system. And I did bring it. So you notch the tube, and then you put the plate in here. And that allows you to make a shear joint. So that when you put the, the weld metal here and here, that weld metal is loaded in shear as opposed to in tension. You uh, are increasing your fatigue capacity by about a factor of three um, just by doing this. Now, it can be a little more work if you worry about uh, being uh, airtight or watertight, that's a problem. You know, you're opening the structure here. But in the context of aluminum and these big ditch, it's not a problem. It's only going to be exposed to atmospheric environments. So the idea of having any, any rain going through the uh, inside of the tube is not a problem. Uh, so why is welding causing this weakening here?
Um, I'm just showing you some test results. This is something we have actually done on um, 6061, this one here. Um, we're looking at the variation. I'm sorry, it's in KSI, so about 300 and changed um, megapascal on top, and um, it's going down all the way to about 50 in next to the well. So this is still the original material. We call it the heat affected zone. So you guys know what happened, right? We went back to solution. So we heated it up beyond this line here, even if it was for a short period of time, we went into solution and then the well cooled off quickly, we quenched it, lost the strength. Uh, and that loss in strength is the reason you're decreasing your fatigue resistance, you're also reducing your, your, your yield properties as well, uh, you're just the static properties. So um, it was a reason for failures on these um, super structures for the radio telescopes because they do rotate it back and forth even if you they only do it a couple times, maybe eight times a day. If you're just starting to add up after 10 years, you have fatigue cracks. Um, and therefore, it's, um, this type of design becomes very important. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a code requirement for bridges. If you're making a bridge and you have these tubular structures, the, the very best standard is to have the gusset plate. And it's very clear also that you can't weld on top here. Because otherwise, it completely defeats the purpose. If you put one area where the weld is perpendicular to your load, that's where the crack is going to start. So it doesn't matter if you only have it in one area as opposed to all around. You just all of a sudden say, oh, well, you know, I don't care <laughs> if I start having cracks and weakening. So it's another problem that I, I've seen a lot of failures of tubular joints just by not respecting the concept. Um, that's always something, if you look at it from a, just a pull out effect, if you load it at it once, of course you get the benefit of having this extra material here, but when it's a cyclic load, it, it hits this area each time. It doesn't matter how much more you have here. It's the same stress that goes through this location and get the crack to start essentially. So it really becomes a problem. So, aluminum alloys are very useful. Um, it's, I think it's good for you to keep in mind that the treatment itself, the quenching, in the case of aluminum, just gets you into a super saturated solution that is soft and um, relatively low in terms of strength. And it's this aging process that really creates you the strength that you want depending on the characteristic you're looking for, and then you start welding it, you have a problem. Now, we're going to talk about steel, uh, which is very different. Um, so the steel at high temperature is just like the aluminum, FCC structure. When it cools and reaches this um, 740, uh, degree centigrade temperature, it wants to transform into a body-centered cubic structure, this one. Uh, it is associated with, of course, a lot of rearrangement of the atoms, but it's on a very small scale. Now, the problem well, no, I should, the, the reason we use steel is in this process of going from this structure to this one, you lose a lot of ability to have carbon into your structure. So at this high temperature here, it's the gamma phase, and we can take at this peak here up to 0.8% carbon. Let me go back to this whole thing here. So this is another phase diagram. We have iron here and we have carbon. Before, when we were talking about cast iron, we were in this range here where we were putting enough carbon to reduce the melting point. So we were just over here. Right now, we're talking about steel, so we have less carbon. It's pretty high melting point, so that's why we, we have all this 
thermal treatment to, to essentially make good quality rod product. From when we have the rod product, if we're up rolling, we're in this range here. It's this very ductile material. If we cool it at a reasonable temperature, uh, at a reasonable rate, not too fast, if it's not a quench, then you reach this 700 temperature range where all of a sudden you don't have much ability, if any, to have carbon in the iron phase. So the carbon goes into this, the cementite, it's essentially become a carbide. And that's um, the regular transformation. It does lead to hardening by itself. And it's the equilibrium transformation. Uh, I realize that it's a lot of different things to try to cover at one time. But we'll see how we go. Um, so we have this essentially single face. These, these letters are not exactly correct. So we have um, a transformation where, now I, I won't use this. This is not working for us. You wait a second. Yeah, this is good, but okay, I'll do it here. Um, We have the pure iron transforms. That's one difference that we did not have with the aluminum. And that is why, if we're looking here, and we have the 0.8% carbon, um, and the cementite here, um, three C, has about six weight percent carbon and does not have any solubility for the alpha phase. So it's a very, very complex change from this phase to these two, where here all the carbon is with the, with the, um, the austenite, with the, within the FCC structure, and then you end up with no carbon here and about 6 to 8% carbon on the other phase. Um, it becomes a little bit like our dendrites in this case. So you, you start to move the carbon from this um, iron-rich phase to the other phase. And we do end up with um, that perlite. So let's move on to show what it looks like. OK. So this is what happens when you're cooling it quickly, uh, slowly. You end up with grains that essentially just have the, the iron. Um, where are we going here? This is almost pure iron, and then you have other grains that will have the, the, the two phase structure with the Fe3C carbide type, and then. Um, the, iron, the pure iron in between them. Um, and that's what we call the perlite. All right. The perlite is not super uh, strong in strength. Um, and the main reason, so this is where we're looking at about a 250 megapascal strength. It's what we have with a lot of structural steel um, because you can weld it easily. It has a lot of ductility. The reason it has the ductility, it has this um, almost pure uh, iron face in it. Um, now, a lot of people think that that is not enough. So they'll decide to do a special heat treatment. They'll do a quench of the steel. So this, again, is without quenching. If you quench the steel, what happens is instead of going from our FCC structure to the uh, body-centered cubic, you go into another um, a crystal structure, it's the uh, tetragonal structure. Um, 
which essentially just means instead of being a cube, there's one direction here that is longer. The vertical direction is longer. And what it does is it gives the space to fit in the carbon. Because if you're going to go quickly in quenching, you don't have the time for the carbon to go into the cementite zone. You, you're essentially avoiding the diffusion. It becomes what we call a military transformation. So this one is the martensite. And um, it's very, very high strength. So if we don't age the martensite, oh boy, it's Rockwell C55. Um, we can go up to somewhere of the order of uh, more than 1,000 megapascal. I'll put it plus. Um, the problem here is now that we have um, essentially a, um, a structure with very little symmetry, it's not going to be able to deform. Um, and that's a problem with most structural alloys. If you want to have um, any kind of metal in a structure, especially if it's welded, if it's got bolts or rivets, and you can't allow one little area of that part to stretch a little bit before it breaks, um, it's not reliable on a structural sense because we talk about very complex structure. I mean, think of an aircraft when it's landing and everything is making all sorts of noise. So locally, there will be area, and it's not always the same place, but there will be areas that are overloaded and what you want is for the material to deform instead of breaking. It's a little bit like if we were saying we'll make everything out of glass. It's not going to work because every once in a while there's a little impact, there's a little something, and we will reach yield. So the reason I'm mentioning it is there is no real structural application where we have martensite in the steel. That would be a really bad situation unless... Um, it's not going to be used in tension. So some tool steel will have some martensite, and that's why you drop it and it breaks. Uh, but we've talked about a real structure. You have to do something with this quench structure. So the main difference between aluminum and the steel here is as soon as you quench, it becomes really brittle. And that's going to have a lot of implications when we start talking about welding because if you take a steel that will go easily through a martensite transformation, then it's very hard to weld it because each time you weld, you quench it. You heat it up and you cool it quickly. So it becomes pretty brittle. Um, for the cases that you don't need welding, um, one of the, I guess, highlighted cases here is any kind of high strength steel used for pipes is going to go through this process where you put it up here in solution, you quench it, and then you temper it. Now, again, the, the word tempering in this case, um, I don't know that it's appropriate, but it's, it's, it should essentially say softening. Because you can't go any harder than, than this martensite. All you can do at this point is go to back towards the equilibrium of those two phases here, the, the alpha and the, uh, the cementite, the FA3C. Um, so there are different ways to do this, and it becomes a little bit like our, a story with the aluminum. You have certain temperatures that are going to give you different types of, instead of precipitates here, it's phase transformation. So we're looking at at the very beginning, the, the, the Martin site is going to be just a single face, but it looks actually pretty complex under the microscope. And then it's transforming back to these faces, and it keeps the, the same general look. So this is essentially an example of what the Martin site looks like. It's very, very, very different from 
these types of steel structure here. So when you, when you look under the microscope, you do know what you have, whether it, it did go through um, heat treatment, a quenching process or not. Now, it will keep a little bit that look even if you temper it. So it's just part of what it is because everything that happens in the tempering process is on a very fine scale. You're at low temperature and you can't move it the way you were able to move to form this perlite. Uh, you don't have as much diffusion force. So one reason why it has this look is it goes through this military transformation. We saw some twins when we were looking into uh, some brass uh, structure that I showed you inside the grains. This is a little bit what happens here. So you take for your original grain structure, you deform it a little bit in a certain way, it becomes tetragonal, and all the carbon goes into one site. So they used to be able to go and distribute themselves at these brown sites, a little bit everywhere, everything was cool, very symmetrical structure. Now all of a sudden, you're forced to make this distance longer, and then you only have a few sites where you can put the atoms, the carbon atoms. Um, so what exactly do we do to make um, high strength steel? We try to add alloying elements that will prevent the formation of the perlite. So if you look at uh, a typical a high strength steel alloy like a 4140, for example, is, and I'm just putting it here so it's another four digits except that it's AISC. AISI, and uh, all it means is we have a little bit of chrome in it and we have a little bit of nickel. Those two uh, elements help prevent the formation of this perlite, so it's easier to quench because the heart, and that was something you pointed out earlier when we were talking about the difference between the center of a part and the surface of a part, is with steel and aluminum sometimes, it's hard to take from the high temperature to the low temperature and have the entire structure to transform quickly. So by adding a little bit of alloying, you essentially postpone this transformation and you get your martensite on a larger piece. So this is where it's going through here. Instead of being alloying concentration here, it's the time. So this is essentially a, a cooling diagram that helps you see how you, what's the cooling rate you need to avoid forming the, the perlite or the bainite. We haven't talked about the, the bainite, but it's another variation of a, of a, um, a perlite. Um, so you, you quench it slow enough that you can reach this, this rapid transformation is really what, what's going on here. So if we able to do that, then our next step is to heat back up and then con get a certain structure we're looking at and the bainite is the most typical structure. So um, I hope that you'll get the difference <laughs> and remember it between aluminum and steel. And um, what I wanna do, so for next week, I will be lecturing Monday and Wednesday. Professor Yeager is going to do Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. So I'll update that on the website. Um, you don't need to remember all the details, but um, perhaps one thing to keep in mind is as you go to all these high strengths, whether it's aluminum or steel, as soon as you have welding, you're changing all of that again. Um, and when we talk about these high strength steel, they use for landing gears, for example, because you need super high strength, you're limited in space, and it's more efficient and reliable than any aluminum alloy. Um, but um, you can't weld it. Everything has to be bolted connection, essentially. Forge components, everything needs to be really, um, control so there's not a lot of assembly. Um, and that's where your cost really goes up. Um, for most 
the majority of the steel we use, it is this type of perlite. It's just a regular strength structural steel for the reason that we want to be able to weld it without making it brittle. Um, and we'll see what I'm planning to do on Monday is I'll go through more practical example of where we do use high strength steel. Um, and then we'll move back to you know why we use welding and how exactly welding works and what to look for in welding. All right, that was a tough one. <laughs>